Hi, everybody. We're the Skeleton Crew, and today we are talking about the first dinosaur that was ever known to science. Before we get into talking about Megalosaurus, um, we're going to briefly introduce ourselves to you, but before we even introduce ourselves to you, I am contractually obligated to remind you that we have a Patreon page that you should go support if you like our videos. I should also remind you that if you can't support us on Patreon, which is very understandable, uh, we'd appreciate it if at the very least you could like and comment on these videos and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. With that stated, I am Dr. James Napoli. I am a postdoctoral researcher at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences and North Carolina State University. My name is Scott Johnston. I am the vertebrate paleontology fossil preparator and technician at Harvard University's Museum of Comparative Zoology. I am Alex Rubenstahl, a PhD candidate at Yale University and the most serious scientist of anyone here based on my eyewear. And I'm Dalton Meyer, and I'm a victim of stolen valor, because those are my <laughs> goggle glasses. Lose, you lose, he bro. stole your loops? He stole my loops. Where'd you get those? I want a pair. Oh, genuinely. On Amazon. Oh. Ooh. But moving your head very quickly in these while looking through them is a bad idea. Makes you very <laughs> nauseous. <laughs> that's, that's my curse. The, bit, that's, the, bit, the bit's over. They're going down. That's the curse of my loops. Uh, I'm also a PhD student at Yale University. Together, we're the skeleton crew. We're the skeleton. Most crew. of it. Most crew. of it. Yes, Most. we should. We should acknowledge the absent member here. Um, Amelia wasn't able to join us today. She is back visiting family, um, and we don't want. Visiting she's family. visiting family, and we. She's been sacrificed to the large mouth that lives underneath Dalton. Uh, Dalton, our apartment. That's what we call visiting family. Right. We call it the heck mouth because we want to be able to say it in schools. Yeah, we want to monetize. We got to stay monetized. Um, I, I I actually came out of there about two years ago. Yeah, I remember, I remember that day. It changed my life forever, and not for the positive. <laughs> it, it 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 rained black liquid for almost eight hours. <laughs> but that's a normal New Haven day, so we actually didn't really remark. Yeah, it. no one noticed. Just another day in Connecticut. Kind of black smoke. The Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences at Yale University has chosen a new PhD student. Um, <laughs> all right. Without further ado, Dalton, let's see this thing uh, as it is born. Certainly. No more ado. What dinosaur are we doing today? Well, this one. It does have a nice release animation. Can't you tell? It has yeah. a very nice release animation. You know, I'm looking at it, and now my, my opinions aren't quite as severe as they once were. My opinions are more severe. I forget how much I hate it every time I look at it. This is Megalosaurus, everybody. <laughs> Or, if you're a friend across the pond, <laughs> or Megalosaurus, as Jimbo says. Well, I... I thought that was... A, that's a, no, no, I say Megalosaurus. Well, I, I usually say Megalosaurus for the species name, or for the genus name, rather. But a lot of the time, I hear people refer to the clade as Megalosaurus, which is... Uh, it's something... Mm. I don't know if it's a linguistic thing that happens when you um, change the sound at the end. Speaking of linguistics, what does Megalosaurus mean? Good segue. Thank you. Big lizard. Big lizard. Yeah. <laughs> big lizard. It, it Ladies big lizard. and gentlemen, the big lizard. I lost them. Hang on. Wait. We lost the big lizard. Ladies and gentlemen, there's just one gentlemen. of them. This big lizard. We got him. Buckland's big yeah. lizard. Him. Oh, it's Bucklandy? Yeah. 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 Buckland. Okay, cool. Named after William Buckland. How many species are there? So many. Uh, well, real. how many valid species? Only are one. There? <laughs> yeah, they're. Man, that's a mess. Um, but let's get into that in a moment. I want to tell the story about William Buckland. Okay. Sweet. Okay. I am briefly confirming before I slander the man. Is this um, out of curiosity? Is this about something? Yes, he ate? it is. So, William Buckland has the rare distinction of having a Wikipedia page section called Known Eccentricities, which is... I like that they're... How I'm trying it, Right. It's great that we're assuming that there are unknown ones that have been lost to time, so we, we're like, these are only the ones we know about. Um, this includes that he... They need to have a scientific basis. He would do all of his fieldwork wearing one of those big academic gowns that you get when you get a PhD. 
shut up. No. Right. Dang. Absolute king shit. Like he ha he bought one of those for his graduation. He's like, I'm gonna get my money's worth out of this. <laughs> um, he had a table at his home inlaid with dinosaur copper lights. Um, but he was also an active zoo phage, uh, which meant that he went out of his way to eat as many different types of meat as he could. Um, it says on his Wikipedia page, and I quote. The most distasteful items were mole and blue bottle fly, but panther, crocodile, and mouse were among the other dishes that his guests noted. Um, apparently, at one point, okay. he also consumed the mummified heart of the French king Louis the Sixth, Louis the Fourteenth. <laughs> at least, at a, least part a part of, of it. <laughs> um, now, there used to be a story quoted here that was like a direct recounting by <laughs> a friend. No, no, I'm not. I, we're what? barreling forward. <laughs> No, it, time out. Scott, you got a roll of it. So he apparently was shown the heart. It was, I think, a curiosity that one of his wealthy academic friends in Britain had obtained. And he said, you know, William, look at this. This is my new prized possession. The mummified heart of Louis the Fourteenth. After at which apparently Buckland just lunged forward and I quote, gobbled it up. <laughs> it's like that f meme. Okay, well, <laughs> I know what my editing project is going yeah. to be. <laughs> so, oh, I love. Oh God, viewer, episode viewer, because Dalton's going to do that one. If one of our fans could, because I pick, I'm picturing something in my head, which is like a nice shot, wide, wide shot of like a London zoo, and then. William Buckland's head, like, just enormous <laughs> on the horizon with Galactus. <laughs> <laughs> Make it. Do it. Someone do that, please. <laughs> oh, <we lost> Scott. <laughs> He's <laughs> off. <laughs> he cobbled it up. Alex. <laughs> Alex, I don't know if you saw yeah. me make a face earlier, and I, I think with our new, our new technology, you're not hearing the game audio, unfortunately. I implore you at some point to play with Megalosaurus because I swear it just made the suburban Sasquatch noise. <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay, cool. Also, viewers, check out Suburban Sasquatch. Great film. Um, I'm realizing now that we've been recording for ten minutes and we've we're on our we've we've already like just checked out the VOR uh, requirements for our for our <laughs> daily video. Twice, actually. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Anyway, um, you want to do history for it? Yeah, let's get right, yeah. into history. Yeah, so uh, everything makes we... sense in terms of the context. Right. Knowing that William... Why are we talking about Well, William knowing Buckland? that William Buckland ate everything that he could. Um, <laughs> Dude was Kirby. Right. He was just <laughs> running around. I, I, like, I just love learning that people in the past were just as weird as we are today. <laughs> just, weirder, just absolute weirder. weirdos. James, have any of you met someone who you're just like, hey, look at my new prized possession, and they immediately wrestled it from you and threw it down their <laughs> No, I like throat. the word the like, word lunge because it implies that he went mouth first at it. Like yeah. just <laughs> falling forward, like oh, no 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 no. Eating eating dried human remains is a proud European tradition. It is it's like a whole culture of like corpse eating yeah. in Spain. Well, also that that's where all that's where all the mummies went. I mean, oh, I guess by the transitive Mummy property, um, Buckland ate a bunch of mummies as well because didn't Louis the Fourteenth keep a little like sack of mummified human remains on him for like good luck or something? Maybe. Uh, yeah. So normal. <laughs> Everyone's so right. Crazy. So crazy. The week of recording this is the week where the the girl on TikTok doing a TikTok live thing where it's the the NPC oh thing where you just give commands and she repeats like a set phrase at every command is going viral. And I'm I'm perplexed by this cultural phenomenon. Don't get me wrong, but humans are weird. Sorry, I was just I was in the mid middle of reading that apparently King Louis the Fourteenth uh, reportedly had a stomach that was twice the normal size for a human. <laughs> I, this bad boy can fit so many mummies. <laughs> slaps roof of stomach. <laughs> Sat, slaps roof of King Louis the Fourteenth. This French monarch can fit so many fucking mummies. Um, God, 
His wife was famous for saying, let the dead go. <laughs> so anyway, people have always been bizarre. Human behavior is the one thing that nobody will ever fully understand. Um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I just, the, the first line of this, of this article I'm reading is, when French King Louis XIV died in 1715, his stomach was reportedly twice the size of an average human. I like how they said average human, not average human stomach, because it makes it seem way worse. <laughs> Louis was known for his voracious appetite, but little did he know that three quarters of a century after his death, one of his organs would become a meal of its own. William Buckland, a geologist and dean of Westminster, ate his heart. Period. New paragraph. <laughs> if, if he had been killed in one of the French revolutions, like the guillotine would have come down and a new guy would have just popped out from underneath it like a fucking nesting doll. He's a fucking <laughs> Trioshka doll. Oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> you, re you, you freed me. Now I can become the true king of France. <laughs> So, well, uh, on the, oh along the vein of, of, I'm sorry, sorry. I've got one more sorry. anecdote. This is tangentially oh. related. Um, but now that we're talking about the autopsies of European monarchs, we'd of course be remiss to not mention Charles II of Spain, who was one of the Habsburgs, and he was incredibly inbred. Um, oh, yeah. His, his autopsy report, which was, he died right after he turned 39. It's just roasting Right, him. his heart was the size of a peppercorn. His lungs corroded. His intestines rotten and gangrenous. He had a single testicle black as coal, and his head was full of water. <laughs> this, this, this sounds like the lines from the Grinch song. Yeah. <laughs> or like, if you were making this, it's like how you construct like some kind of potion. Or something. Right. You're a you mean one, Mr. Habsburg. You're the real life McCoy. Exactly. <laughs> I mean... Right. Yeah. Also, they said his body did not contain a single drop of blood. A single drop of blood. Um, and the phrase, as it's uh, as it's often stated, was that he repeatedly ba he baffled uh, he repeatedly baffled Christendom by continuing to live. <laughs> Good on. I respect that. Anyway, uh, so Megalosaurus. I also think it's important to note that Dalton is going to have to add so many Quetzalcoatlus honks into this section because we, we were just unable to contain the curses that spewed forth from our bodies. Um, it's going to be a fun section for y'all to listen to. I'm excited to see it. Much like, much like William Buckland couldn't contain his urge to eat human remains. <laughs> uh, well, speaking of the report that didn't like it? I don't think we have a uh, note about that, yeah. I, I, I mean... French food is supposed to be good, so. <laughs> right. okay. Yeah, it wasn't soaked speaking in two of pounds animals, of butter to make it taste good. Speaking speaking yeah. of organisms that have Something baffled there, Christendom man. by continuing to live, let's talk about Megalosaurus. And quite literally, actually, that's actually a pretty good segue because this thing was controversial. Right. Yeah. At his, no, at his was. I, I can attest to this. I am Christendom and I am baffled. We've talked a bit about. William Buckland in his known eccentricities. But let, uh, yum, yum, yum. Stop it. <laughs> but, um... If William Buckland uh, were I, a TikTok girl way. now doing a live stream, his little react button would say, mm, the heart of King Louis XIV, so good. Yum, yum. <laughs> <laughs> While he pops popcorn in his <laughs> That's kind of wild. I, I that seems like a fun thing. I, I was tempted to see if I could give that a try. Get a hair straightener and pop popcorn. That yeah. does. Mm -hmm. That's the best part of it. Anyway, anyway, will we ever succeed in talking about the history of Megalosaurus? Or well, we might. Let's try again. Dalton, one of your uh, Megalosaurus or Megalosaurus. Is suffering from low health. What happened? Its heart was eaten by William Buckland. It's hungry, despite the fact that I put many food. But I'll you put a more. dispenser dispensing the heart of King Louis the Fourteenth. Oh my yeah. god! So, Megalosaurus. mark on the bingo card. James repeats a joke one more time than is actually funny. There, <laughs> yeah, you there go. we go. I gave it right to you. So, Megalosaurus was debatably discovered in like the in the late 1600s 
debatably, how do you mean? Uh, in that a lot of... Ah, oh, man. A lot of the, the things that have been or will be attributed to this dinosaur have been incredibly widely disputed. And by that, we mean uh, pretty much every time that people picked up a fossil bone in the years right before and a bit after, well, for like a hundred years after, um, it got labeled as Megalosaurus first. I'm, I'm being a bit facetious on that, but uh, we'll talk. Uh, we'll have James talk about that a bit later. Um, well, yeah. I mean, I think it's important to point out to our audience and viewers that Megalosaurus, the name, predates dinosaurs. Yes, Dinosauria. So if you found a big bone and you Hang like on. had a passive awareness of natural history, you might be tempted to be like, "I found a Megalosaurus." Megalosaurus was a f uh, like teeth of it were found back in like the late 1600s um and were eventually described as megalosaur teeth but the real um original specimen of it was found in uh a quarry uh called uh tainton uh, uh sorry the tainton limestone uh mm -hmm. shale quarry and this thing is also a little bit hard to talk about when it comes to individual specimens because almost all of them have been lost to time. Uh, individual ones keep getting uh, keep getting mentioned in histories and then mentioned. They was just like, well, we only know it from this single illustration. And uh, what I think is absolutely the funniest one, and I think is uh, objectively the funniest one, is this distal end of a femur uh, that was found uh, in oh gosh in uh, 1676 uh, uh, in that Tainton limestone uh, and if you've ever seen I mean we'll throw it up on screen activate what do you audience what do you think this looks like? Be honest. Tell us in the comments. Don't do that. You'll get their video demonetized. Um, <laughs> we can't afford it. We can't it. afford that. Um, so this specimen was uh, given, uh, was eventually given the name Scrotum Humanum. And there is actually some debate over whether or not that was the researcher or the uh, well whether that was the the uh uh the researcher whose name was Robert Plot uh whether that was his attempt to give this new animal a Linnaean binomial name or whether that was just him labeling his drawing and apparently there's some debate that went back and forth for a while because, uh, and you, you might sa uh, say that, hey, Scott, that sounds like some really ridiculous pedantry. What does it really matter? Well, technically speaking, because this was published back in uh, 1677 in uh, a book of the uh, called The Natural History of Oxfordshire, um, that would technically mean that the first name ever given to a dinosaur was Scrotum Humanum. And would be hilarious. And by the laws of, um, oh, what is it? The, the governing the body? ICZN. The ICZN, which is the International Commission for Zoological Nomenclature, I mm -hmm. believe. Uh, they have a law that the first thing that gets named gets to keep that name. And it must be assigned that. So. There are some outside cases and everything, but so that would technically mean that, yeah, the first dinosaur was named Scrotum Humanum, which is objectively the funniest thing on it. Or Earth. Scrotum to his it friends. Or Scrotum yeah. to his friends. I do Brody. really, really like the idea of seeing like a uh, a teacher talking to their students of just like, oh, we're going to learn about the origins of dinosaurs today. Ooh. 
named by Sir Richard Owen in the 1820s. He named it based off of three species. There was Iguanodon, there was Hyliosaurus, and Balsack. <laughs> so there's some interesting extra history about Scrotum Humanum that I kind of want to talk about. Oh, please. Uh, which is uh, some things I learned today while doing research for this video. One, it even though it was like... Again, it wasn't really given the name Scrotum Humanum, but the, the illustration was labeled Scrotum Humanum. Um, so there's some, un, some like Scott mentioned, uh, unclarity of intent with that. Um, no one ever actually thought it was like a petrified scrotum. It was, by all people who looked at it, recognized to be the end of a leg bone. Um, the first people who looked at it, the first person was a priest, I forget his name. Um, and he thought it was probably an elephant. He, he again, these people, and it's important to remember for the context of of scrotum humanum and later Megalosaurus, that this is before people really had a concept of extinction. There was no concept of deep time. Um, you know, the idea that there were animals that weren't around today was antithetical to the idea that God had created a perfect world. And so this priest saw this bone. He's like, "Oh, there's nothing like this. Or this is bigger than anything that lives in England today." It might, it's probably a, a, a Roman war elephant that died. And that was the first thought, which isn't, you know, the worst idea in the world. Later, then, he's, he amended his idea that, no, this is actually the end of a, the femur of a giant human, as they were described in the Bible. So it was thought to be, at one point, thought to be from a giant human, but it was not thought to be, you know, a petrified scrotum. The other interesting thing is that it's also unclear if the intent was to give it a name, if this if the intent was to name the animal scrotum humanum or to name like the rock scrotum humanum because at this time when Linnaeus devised um, his classification scheme of, of what we call the binomial right it's like genus species the two latin names um, that was for for animals for living things but he also wanted to extend that classification to inorganic things and so there were attempts to name various rocks and minerals with a latin binomial um, and so it's unclear what the intent for Scrotum Humanum was. Uh, but the impact is still one of the funniest names ever given to a fossil. Uh, I'll also interject real quick here because I actually I got my facts very slightly crossed. Um, it was an, the illustration was by Robert Plot, and I um, and I said Plot was the one that labeled it Scrotum Humanum. It actually wasn't. It was Richard Brooks in his 1763 uh, book. That's so, right. I I apologize. Right. For that. Richard Brooks is well known for naming different rocks after gross or unsavory parts of the human body. Um, Wait, really? No. I, <laughs> uh, See, we um, we already yeah. have Buckland eating. <laughs> yeah, the right. French monarch. We, we set the we, bar for weird old behavior been, real high. The shark yeah. has been jumped a while. Ago. Right. Just and and just the thing, just the thing I want to say, uh, because it, in in the story, Dalton, Dalton, right? Like, it's a it's a priest who's looking at them mm -hmm. oh, no. and making these initial comparisons and. For perhaps our viewers who aren't particularly familiar with history uh, or the history of science, um, at least in many parts of Europe, uh, priests were had some natural uh, training in the natural world. Uh, especially the Jesuits, there was a lot of early science that came out of there, and for quite some time, uh, these naturalist priests, as they were often called, uh, were very closely linked to natural history and natural sciences. Uh, and that that was. I want to say that was the case for at least a hundred years. Right? Oh, I mean, it, I mean, depending on how you define it, it could extend well into the 1800s, right? Like hundreds of years where yeah. primarily it was clergymen who had a lot of time on their hands and started to ask questions like this. And to my understanding, it really arose from yeah. an idea to like, you need to understand God's creation, right? So mm -hmm. you, so you study different parts of it. Um, Hell, even when I was down in Brazil recently, uh, a bunch of the uh, fossil formations that we took a look at in some of the areas around there, um, it was told that were discovered by uh, a, these twin brothers, one of which was a priest, and just yep. did some exploring around mm -hmm. his um, local area. Uh, apparently, they literally drove around in a Volkswagen Beetle 
with like one of them with a pair of binoculars just looking out the window as they bumped along it was just like that's a fossil and then would just drive over and find it so that that's funny because our our field season was in lesotho in like 2017 2018 was we were checking out a site of an old jesuit uh, priest who had found like all these like these are dinosaur bones those are dinosaur bones fantastic formations but yeah so so yeah it's, yeah and actually oh, what if it was the same guy <laughs> that would be oh, funny yeah. <laughs> um speaking of of the um kind of development of a professional scientific class and the early correlation with the clergy to my knowledge one of the first professional scientists who was not a clergyman was actually richard owen who was something of a unique figure mm. uh in the world of victor like i guess this would classify as victorian naturalism because he did not have the background of a wealthy um aristocrat and was not a member of the clergy he was somebody who had i think come from a fairly um a fairly poor background i don't think he grew up in abject poverty but he certainly didn't have a lot of status and then went to study to be a surgeon and i think that led him into a career in the natural in the natural sciences um it's one of the reasons he published so much. He, like, he was doing that for a job. But at the time, he was one of the very few naturalists who was actually a career naturalist, not just doing it evocationally. And famously quite Right, everybody <laughs> loved him. Oh, God, was he... Yeah. Well... He was apparently very mean. Well, he was yeah, he, he was not a nice guy. I actually didn't know yeah. that. Yeah. We can talk about more. Well, I guess we can talk about that now, because... Richard Owen's kind of sent at the center stage for this. Mm -hmm. Well, I think William Buckland is more the center stage for Megalosaurus. As it, it is named out. after him. Yeah, I, I guess. I guess I meant more for just dinosaurs. Yes, for dinosaurs. Okay. Yeah, it's Owen. Right. Uh, well, tell me more about Mr. Buckland, Alton. Well, certainly I can. I'll, I'll tell you some more. Well, so first of all, William Buckland is the very Reverend William Buckland. At least according to Wikipedia, that's his title. Very reverend. I don't really understand what makes him the very reverend as opposed to the reverend. You start off as regular title. reverend and then you become like super reverend. No, very reverend, super reverend, giga reverend. This yeah. man is extremely um, reverend. But there, there's there's a dried like infant husk that you have to find in a shrine in the UK somewhere. You have to eat uh, it? And if you like eat it, you become the very reverend. Well, they found the right guy. So, and knowing Buckland, <laughs> yeah, he'll so, do it. Yeah. So Buckland is 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 famously linked with Megalosaurus, and, for, and it's named after him. It should be clarified; he did not name it after himself. Um, Buckland named Megalosaurus Megalosaurus, and at the time, it was very common to just name things a genus and not a species. And later, it was named uh, Megalosaurus Buckland-I. And I don't recall off the top of my head who. Uh, I think I I think that was Owen Mantel. Oh, it was Mantel. It was Mantel, right? Mantel, Gideon Mantel. Um, and so Buckland was a was a reverend. He was one of these very reverend. He was the very reverend, and he's one of these reverend naturalists that we were talking about earlier. So he's a learned man. He's part of the clergy. Um, and when he was getting educated, he became very interested in geology, and I'm getting away from Megalosaurus in the game because this is moving away from Megalosaurus. And just exploring the history of, of Buckland, who's actually very interesting, beyond the fact that he ate a dead king's heart. Um, allegedly. Allegedly. So he was a priest at this time. He was very interested in geology, and he was very interested in like sedimentary geology. And he later becomes kind of obsessed with coprolites, hence the coprolite table. Um, but he's doing all this work, and kind of the early thing that, that made him famous in the scientific community is he went to this cave... Um, Kirkdale Cave in England, which was a cave that had a bunch of Pleistocene bones in it, and so it had like hyenas and hippos and elephants and a bunch of things that obviously weren't in Britain. And at the time, because again, this predates conceptions of deep time, this is just at the time when the idea of uniformitarianism is catching on. So that's the idea that processes that happen today happened in the same way and at the same speed in the past. So that like the accumulation of sediments, maybe it took a really long time as opposed to being one big catastrophic event. And this cave full of Pleistocene mammals that don't live in England anymore was 
used as a piece of evidence from people like, oh, this is from the flood. These are bones of animals from Africa that were washed to England and then got in this cave during the, the biblical flood. And Buckland was first and foremost a reverend, but was also like a keen observer and very interested in geology. And he's like, no, I don't think these are from the flood because all of these bones that aren't the hyenas have been gnawed. Um, they all look like they've been scavenged. There are a lot of coprolites in here that he did a lot of research and that looking at like hyenas and zoos and looking at their scat was like, this all looks like the poop of hyenas. It's like, this is very clearly a hyena den. And they were taking these kills back here and eating them and gnawing on them. And that's what this cave was. This wasn't deposited in the flood. This was at a time, he's like, at some point in the past, hyenas and all these animals must have lived in, in Britain and they're not there anymore. Now this doesn't really run afoul of the idea of extinction because they, these animals are all still around at least as far as he was aware, I don't know if any of these ended up being like extinct Pleistocene species or not. Um, but as far as he knew, these are all extant animals. They just don't live here anymore. And that's, you know, perfectly fine in, in a worldview where there's no extinction. Um, but he, studying geology and studying this cave, like this isn't evidence for the flood. And there were at the time, a lot of people trying to make, especially if they were studying sedimentary geology, trying to invoke the biblical flood for depositing like all of the world's sediments, right? Like all of these rocks today are this way because of the flood. And he was a priest and he's like, no, that doesn't make any sense. He's like, if you look at all of these rocks, like, they don't look like they were deposited in one event. Like these are very clearly deposited very slowly. And he's like, we are, there is a way, he's like, we have to reconcile this idea of deep time with the idea of the Bible. Um, and so he's what we would consider an older creationist, Alex, good question. Do you mind if I just just add a little, just a little? Note? Yeah, go for it. So, so on on Dalton's talking about kind of this 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 idea of of kind of explaining the sedimentary layers because geology was coming into focus as a science at the time, and there was a, a, a group um, of learned men that um, who were trying to explain it with the flood, and this was generally this this argument is kind of broken down into two camps: the Neptunists and the Plutonists, and the Neptunists. Surprise! They're, they're the proponents that uh, that rocks are laid down from uh, the flood or oceans or similar processes to this catastrophically quickly. Um, and it was, I think, the Giant's Causeway, right? In a, well, maybe uh, I don't remember this from my island, geo classes. Uh, where this became essentially there was there was this debate: Did basalt come from the sea? Mm, yeah. Like, can basalt basalt be produced? Uh, from the ocean. It's a volcanic rock to our viewers that has produced a uh, volcano. Um, and when observations of lavas forming were made uh, and then compared to known basalt provinces, this was kind of this, a very important moment in the, in the formation of the uniformitarianism camp and more or less the birth of the Plutonists, I think. But this was all happening like on the same island, which is kind of shocking. Yeah. Um, but so... Anyway, um, Buckland finds this cave. He's like, this isn't evidence of the flood. It should be set and noted. There's like a layer of mud in the cave. And he's like, you know, that was probably the flood did that. The flood probably brought this mud in here. The flood didn't bring all these bones into this cave um, and like aggregate them together. This is clearly the animals doing that. And so that was kind of his inception into the, the beginnings of thinking about deep time in the fossil record. Also, this very big interest into coprolites. And then they start finding all these fossils in England. And famously, you know, Mary Anning is finding all these fossil reptiles in the south and on the Jurassic Coast. And then Buckland is presented with a jaw from the taint and limestone. And it's a jaw of a, of a big carnivorous, it didn't know at the time, a dinosaur. The name didn't exist yet. Um, but he compares it and he gets other people to, to look at it. And I believe uh, Cuvier came and looked at it and was like, oh, this is like a lizard. Like this is this is very clearly a reptile um and so the idea is oh this is a giant reptile this is some kind of giant lizard that did, doesn't live anymore and there's there's no way to reconcile that so like this then leads to buckland kind of i would i would consider him a, bit, a bit of a bridge between kind of the the ideas of like huxley who's like big into extinction and the, the mainstream thought of the time of there is no extinction in god's perfect world and so buckland has a very interesting theology that I learned about that is very cool. And that he 
he comes up with this idea that like biblical creation is true and genesis is true so the six days of creation are what happened but when the bible says in the beginning it's not referring to like the beginning of the universe it's referring to the beginning of earth as it's useful for humans to understand it and that like eons of time could have passed before that that's all just lumped into in the beginning and so Buckland views this pre-beginning Earth as essentially God setting the stage for Earth to be a home for humans. Mm. And part of that involves the succession of all of these ages and all of these creatures. And he has a really interesting, there's a really interesting book or like series of books that are all of these things that are science and it's, it's like various fields of science. So there's one for like astronomy and physics. There's one for, I think, biology and stuff. And then there's one that he wrote on geology and paleontology or whatever it's named like i think it was geology and maybe fossils and how they relate to um natural theology and it's it's this whole book of him explaining how all of the geologic record he's like hey you know people are getting all these ideas and like that this supports like atheism or pantheism um, or that it's contrary to the Bible, but actually none of this evidence is contrary to the Bible. And he lays out all of his arguments as to why the fossil record and the geologic record as it was understood at the time is compatible with the Bible, including um, what you'll see some young earth creationists argue that like, oh, the carnivorous dinosaurs were actually vegetarian because in the Garden of Eden, right, there's no suffering. Um, so things can't eat meat because you have to kill things to eat meat and there's no death. Um, and Buckland's like, well, obviously there was death before this because we have all these dead animals so death is just a part of the world before god made it ready for humans and he's like carnivores exist and they existed before and it's almost a um alex what's the what's the philosophy that you've been having major beef with recently predator abolitionist. no not just pre no not predator abolitionist but the um oh um what is often called by weirdos online as um effective altruism Effective altruism. So, he, it, yeah. so Buckland invokes kind of an effective altruism to this, where he's like, predators serve to reduce the sum total of animal suffering. He's like, animals have joyful, joyous lives, and then they die. And the, the most merciful death can be is for it to be swift and painless. And animals that get old suffer being sick and old. And so predators remove the suffering of the sick and old by allowing them a quicker death. And so it's like his, him invoking like God's mercy on all of these predators. And that is not totally related to Megalosaurus, but he's like, he points to Megalosaurus as an example of like, see, this is like a perfect predator. It's got enormous teeth, just like, like the, the knives that we use to butcher our animals. Um, these are all examples of like God's perfect creation. Um, I do also find it kind of funny that in his book, when he talks about this, uh, he actually refers to carnivores as, and I quote, the police of nature. Yeah. That's very... Uh, well, he had a correct understanding. Right, of they just kill things. everything. Um, and in Dalton's, in Dalton's story, I think that it kind of, an interesting note that you make uh, is that, you know, he is, he's not saying that there's not death, uh, that, that, that uh, the world prior to the fall is, you know, or in the garden, there's no death, uh, which is kind of because young earth creationism as it exists now is novel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It is not, the, the modern young earth creationism is not like a carried proud tradition from biblical time or even from like the 18th century. It's like this weird neo-evangelical thing. Yeah, and a lot of the the kind of narratives about it being like essentially how that was are, I guess, for lack of a better term, propaganda. I mean, like yeah, and and the the kind of model that Dalton outlines this, this excessive creation and destruction that that Buckland proposes is a hit because I think it's Owen's like view of how these natural cycles work, right? I don't know if it's exactly you know, Owen's. Or like there are multiple separate creations and then death, or is it does Owen get there separately? Owen might get there separately. Owen, I'm not uh, I'm not up I to think... I haven't read a lot of his writing in a while. So Owen yeah, Owen has like a unique view of the world and he is very famously like not accused I would say, but very famously attributed as being anti evolution. 
and especially anti-Darwin. And he was he was definitely anti-Darwin, but it's unclear how like anti-evolution <laughs> Owen really was. Like he seemed to have had his own ideas about what evolution was like and how it happened. Mm -hmm. um, and he he seems to also have just been kind of more private about that because he realized that you know I I should just publicly not talk about this because then I won't get in trouble with any of the people who give me money. Right. And, and I mean, that's one of the yeah. things I remember writing my term paper for a class I took on the development of biological theories of evolution on Owen in particular, and analyzed a lot of his behavior through that lens of, you know, he had to he had to walk a pretty delicate tightrope, right? Because he was expected to be prolific in publishing and be a fairly notable person in the popular sphere. But he was at the mercy of other people in a way that Darwin never was. You know, Dar Darwin's family were not right. extremely powerful landed gentry, but, you know, he had an estate that had tenants on it, and that's where he derived his income. And, you know, yep. um, it's not like he was one of the, you know, essentially warlords who was in charge of the country at that point, but he didn't work for him. And, he, he, and I mean, even if he had needed to, he probably couldn't have for most of his life, given his pretty severe illness that he suffered for a long time. Um, uh, I want to mention... And I'm like, sorry. Go ahead. I'm just going to say a lot of a lot of the work Owen did would be like fundamental right. to evolution, right? Like he he conceives of homology, not exactly how it exists now, but kind of these early the, the, the shared form. Uh, I think he coins the bow plan, right? Or at least he's like. A I think so. I think he it. coins it. I mean, his whole idea is archetypes, right? that there's like a central unified plan for development and that every organism is some alteration to that and every derivation of some new structure is an alteration of the original plan which i believe he also i mean his big claim that i think still has some back and forth in some ways although it, it seems that he's mostly wrong is that the skull uh, are just modified vertebral segments and that the limbs are modified vertebral segments and then he's got ideas for all of these separate ossifications that occur around the centrum of the vertebrae and the various arches and projections off of them, and that, like, the humerus and the radius and the ulna ultimately come from those. Um, it certainly isn't exactly wrong to call some parts of the skull modified vertebrae, but I think his idea that the vertebrae just morphed into a head is not correct. All right, like, the basiox is the basiocipital occipital like a cervical development or is that i think the basiocipital is not quite so the spinal accessory nerve in tetrapods okay. does something weird where it part of it winds up coming up from the spinal cord and then ex entering so it comes up through the foramen magnum and then passes back out through the skull with the rest of the spinal accessory nerve um and a branch of the vagus and so it does a normal cranial nerve thing but it doesn't start in the skull it starts in the spine and so there's been some idea that it's kind okay. of like the recurrent laryngeal nerve, which is an often cited proof of evolution. Um, this is shared by all tetrapods, to my knowledge, that because the heart starts very close to the skull in uh, in the evolution of vertebrates, right? That's where it is in fish. It's right posterior to the skull. Right. Mm -hmm. The laryngeal nerve that originally is going to a target behind it passes posterior to the aortic arches. And in tetrapods, we've developed a neck. Um, and the neck... Kind of pulls forward and so the you can think of it relative to the head as the heart and the rest of the thorax is being pulled down backward and so the route of that nerve which develops quite early nerves develop very early in development is constrained it can't cut itself to reattach on the other side so it gets yanked with the rest of everything else during development and gets carried along um which means that the nerve is almost twice as long as it needs to be it, it would have actually i think by my count been like 60 feet long in some sauropod dinosaurs, which is ludicrous. Depends on the exact cool. position of the larynx. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, this is all a way of saying there's some speculation that the spinal accessory nerve is something similar to that, where there are like vertebral elements getting incorporated into the skull and being part of the basiocipital. I'm not current on the Evo Devo literature right now, though, and I don't know if that's accepted or if there's some other explanation for the structure. And I mean, more widely, this is just to say... Richard yes, Owen's he was, and he's yeah. he should probably be the subject of a video at some point. Um, oh, definitely. But before yeah. we get off of history of science, I want to briefly mention Cuvier, who Dalton mentioned. Um, yeah. 
Because when we talk about these foundational figures, Cuvier is often considered the father of comparative anatomy and the father of paleontology in some ways. Um, so Cuvier is French, if you couldn't tell from the name. Georges Cuvier. Right. Yeah, he's... Father, father, father of extinction, extinction. right. And, and, and that's why I wanted to bring him up, because Dalton mentioned this nascent idea of extinction. The first writings that Cuvier published on extinction as an idea did precede um, Buckland's work on the cave by a couple of years. Um, I, the first one was in 1818 when he published a long treatise on um, elephant fossils. And he was essentially saying, the elephants we're finding in Europe are not the elephants that we know in Africa, and they're not the elephants that we know mm -hmm. in Asia. And they're elephants, so we're pretty sure we'd see them anywhere else if they existed, so they're not something else. Um, so clearly these are types of elephant that do not exist anymore. Um, and he made that claim pretty, uh, pretty fiercely. And I know there was a tremendous amount of pushback from people who did not think that evolution was compatible with God creating the world in a way, you know, God creating the world and creating a world perfectly. Well, Bouvier was pre-evolutionary thought for the most part right no Even well i mean he was contemporary with lamarck and he's actually one of the reasons that evolutionary thought was quashed okay. because he had so he phrases it the principle of the correlation of parts and the principle of the correlation mm -hmm. of parts essentially is just his way of phrasing um organs are correlated because of the function and life history of the organism so as he puts it an animal that has like molars adapted for shearing meat will also have a skull that's capable of slicing through meat and limbs that are developed with claws so that they can run fast and subdue their prey. Basically, the whole animal will be showing specializations for its motive. This is actually something I think to some degree we don't always do in dinosaur paleontology where there are sometimes suggestions of like this kind of mosaic evolution where different parts of the animal don't correlate with one ecological habitus. Um, not that it always has to in as strict a way as Cuvier said, but I've certainly seen papers where it seems that people are invoking one lifestyle um, while ignoring other parts of the anatomy. Um, and we can kind of see this a little bit maybe in the debate over the life history of Spinosaurus. Um, I was about to say, you can you can at Spinosaurus. Well, yeah, I'll at Spinosaurus. <laughs> and I don't think that any of the published explanations for its anatomy are fully satisfactory with explaining every weird thing about the animal. Um, I'm inclined to agree with the with Matteo Fabri and Roger Benson and um, Nazar Ibrahim's approach, and where they've argued pretty persuasively, I think, that it was primarily an aquatic predator. But... Yes. Well, I'd say the published literature doesn't have the correct interpretation, but we do. And we can, and we won't tell you the viewer what it is. But of course, it is <laughs> right. We have a, we have a flawless par like no paradox uh, view of what Spinosaurus is doing, and right. we're not going to tell you. Um, ideally, an explanation of Spinosaurus's anatomy would probably include some explanation of everything that's weird about it. Um, but in any case. Because Cuvier believed in the uh, correlation of parts, he didn't think evolution could occur because it would disturb that balance, especially as Lamarck articulated it, where, like, by use, different parts of the body were being developed differently. And so he saw this as, like, this would lead to the animal not function, right? If you're an animal that's specialized to eat grass, but because of something that happened in your life, you've stretched your neck and now you're too tall to eat the grass and you eat from the top of the tree, it's not going to work, right? The, the species isn't viable. How could this possibly happen? Um, Lamarck, I believe, had died before Darwin published anything on his theory of evolution. Uh, I'm sorry, not Lamarck. Well, maybe Lamarck too, but Cuvier. I would be curious to see what Cuvier would have thought of Darwinian evolution. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because, I mean, a central part of Darwinian evolution is essentially, like, if you find a solution that is not allowable, you will not evolve in that direction. Right? There are going to be these places right. that you kind of can't go. Um, yeah. Well, we've talked so much about Miguel. Well, it's it, Megalosaurus is mostly interesting historically. <laughs> let's let's yes. be honest. Yeah. Um, it, the elephant example from Cuvier made me remember another uh, thing about Buckland, um, which is that Buckland kind of championed Megalosaurus and these other fossil reptiles as as examples against um, 
like flood creationism where he's like he was like he was a staunch creationist but also very staunchly anti like everything can be explained by the flood he mm -hmm. i think was so severe i think i mean reading his work i obviously am putting my own interpretation into how he felt but it seems like he was like no i think i'm right and you all are trying to agree with me but you're making me look stupid he's like if you oh, look at God. these fossils if you look at these fossils and you look at the rocks what you're saying doesn't make sense he's like this doesn't make sense to be deposited in one event he's like you can't explain all of these remains being found in association if they were scattered by a big flood he's like and you can't invoke oh maybe these animals live somewhere else today because he's like because we'd have seen something like megalosaurus around on the earth he's like it just he was i think very happy to have megalosaurus as an example to turn to to support his views on natural history and, and i mean frankly his as as far as like a creationist worldview goes is more correct view of world history that a lot of things happened in the past before humans emerge um, i absolutely love the energy that he has to give off though of just like no 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 all of you agree with me you're just wrong enough about what i think that you think it's wrong right <laughs> i'm gonna cool i'm energy. gonna remember that cool one thing. um in terms of his idea that you would have like seen megalosaurus if it were alive today i think it's worth noting that he misidentified the the uh, ilium as a coracoid which yeah. the coracoid is much smaller hey. than the ilium. Well, I mean, oh, that's not the first he, time that's that's not the last no, time. He thought it was like a sixty foot long. Yeah, monitor. I, I, right. I was gonna say that. Like, uh, also, real quick, why why are they in fast forward? Oh, I accidentally put on. I must have clicked that on accident. Okay. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah um, imagine a sixty foot long monitor lizard, and he's just like, you guys are saying that we just like haven't noticed it yet what is wrong right. with you? We, we yeah. just weren't um, looking that, and it walked past behind us yeah that uh i i know that this brings back to like kind of what i said very <laughs> glibly at the beginning <laughs> um was that uh megalosaurus's name literally just means big right. lizard and uh while, while that is a joke uh it's also uh what they believed um they just kind of thought it was a big lizard uh especially if you see some of the early reconstructions of megalosaurus it's a big lizard it's, it's just a big lizard um but uh, interestingly enough it's actually one of the things that i've always found notable about the even the early reconstructions of megalosaurus is that while it mm -hmm. isn't it, it isn't a hundred percent big lizard that one of the things that they get completely correct in the early reconstructions weirdly is that they always give it an upright gait. They always give its uh, its legs are always directly underneath its body because one of the earliest things that was found on it was a pelvis. And I don't care if you've never seen a dinosaur before, these guys were good enough naturalists to look at the way that the humerus... Uh, humerus, Jesus. I'm not a good naturalist. No, th <laughs> these guys were good enough naturalists to look at the way that the femur articulated with the pelvis and go, this thing didn't have a sprawled gait like a lizard. Whatever this thing was doing, its legs were directly underneath its mm -hmm. body. And, like, that kind of goes to show you that, like, sure, a lot of the other things that they thought were really off base, but that was because they were literally baseless, and I don't mean that as a criticism. I mean that, like, the groundwork hadn't been done on a lot of these fields at that right. point. Right, and an astounding amount yeah. of the stuff that was done at that time has borne out. Like, yeah. with with DNA, yeah. with CT scanning of fossil and modern material, like, the osteology that these people were doing back then, the good ones, it... You know, listen, there have been surprises and there have been changes to interpretations. That's obviously always going to happen. But the fact that, like, from nothing they were able to say, these are probably the main groups of mammals, and more or less they still are, it's astounding. Yeah. I think it's worth pointing out that in Owen's... I think Owen's. Maybe I'm misremembering. But in Owen's or original conception of Megalosaurus, when he, when I believe he kind of thought, wrote about it, was a, a fairly mammal-like... Yes. Mammal, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Oh, mammal, but of an active yeah. predator that would have been more like mammals than than living so, reptiles. Like, and then you know, Huxley was like, "Hey, what if birds uh, came from dinosaurs?" Which is like, it's kind of nutty mm -hmm. how like these 
you know, basically in the first 20 years of dinosaur paleontology, the first two big things that became debates of the entire field were pretty solidly nailed down that everyone thought too hard about it. You're like, what if? So it's interesting it you say this and, and stop, stop, stop Scott me. Scott, stop me if this is something you were going to say about the history, because we still kind of, we still have a bit more history to talk about with Megalosaurus and Richard Owen. Um, but when Richard Owen, Richard Owen is describing dinosaurs after he names them, and he's like, these are, he makes a, a big point to say, this is as close as reptiles have ever come to being mammals. He's like, this is as close that they've ever come to approaching the complexity of mammals, um, which he uses. And I think the reason he named dinosaurs is out of spite, as far as I can tell. Um, he's like, in spite of the this like idea of transmutative progressive evolution, which he d absolutely doesn't believe in, which mm -hmm. is the idea, the evolutionary idea of that like there's an inherent linear progress that life is taking towards more and more complex forms that is more and more approaching humanity because humans are the pinnacle of nature. It's like the whole scale of natura that humans are the closest to God, and then it descends in, in complexity from there. And and Owen's like, well, hey, if this if this transmutative evolution is happening and, and there's always this march towards progress, we should expect that the fossils we see are less complex in his in their view of complexity. That the mm -hmm. fossils are less complex than what we have today. And he's like, but reptiles, dinosaurs are extinct, and they're the most complex reptiles have ever been. So I'm going to name this group of complex reptiles to prove that this like march towards progress doesn't happen. Really yeah, I was not cool. going to say that. Um, I just I reading Buckland's like thing on <laughs> on geology and its implications for natural theology mm -hmm. is maybe the most interesting thing I've read in quite a while. I no, please. They, we we were assigned select sections of his stuff in my uh, sedimentology class that Kathy. Mm -hmm. That's great. With. His ideas are just very cool and like shockingly progressive. And he, he even has a section where he's like describing like he's like oh yeah we're gonna describe how nature has progressed and like marched towards perfection biblically and that like humans are the most perfect of creations but he also is like he has a footnote and he's like but what i mean by that is like they're the most complex and closest to god he's like but if you look at any animal even like a simple worm it's perfectly adapted to what it does he's like all of god's creations are perfect at what they're doing it's just that we are the most perfect of them right so like it it's it's one of those things of like uh, I, I I'm an incredibly tiny tangent and then we'll we'll go off. But it, it's it's one of those things that like I've I've wondered every once in a while that's essentially like and I don't think that this is approaching an answer to the question I'm about to pose, but essentially how far back in time could you basically like kidnap a child and raise it in the modern day and have it be 100% unknowable that that's how that happened. What do you, like 100% what? You you mean like, like at what point, or can you tell, hey, something's not right here? Yeah. Oh. That like, how far back in time, if you were to use a time machine and kidnap a random child and then bring them back to modern day and raise them like a normal kid, how far back in time would you have to go before that is something that you would uh, Well, I mean... It's just like, oh, that that kid's and a bit. No, I mean, I think, I think that's actually the background. That's my understanding of where Ron Perlman came from. He's a surviving Neanderthal. So, <laughs> I I I think you wouldn't notice for quite a while. You'd just be like, man, that guy does yeah. not look good. But do you guys know Otto Mouche? Yes. Oh, I love. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fr Frozen fifties man. So he's got a. He, he says uh, in one video where it's like, and and this is kind of stuck with me. It's like, you know, you people always want to meet their ancestors, but you probably wouldn't have been able to have even if you spoke the same language. Like, you you wouldn't be able to have a decent conversation with anyone born before the industrial revolution because values are different everyone would think you're incredibly soft yeah like, yeah but uh, but i mean i think scott it. means biologically not sociologically right that you you take I mean, you I take a human know, child I mean, and like right if you i think if you raised a neanderthal in the present day you'd just kind of think they looked pretty ugly but i i, I kind of mean i kind of mean both in this in this sense because what, what really like had it ping in my mind again was like thinking about these like 
early paleontology scientists and stuff and just going like fuck if you really boil down some of these ideas like that's not off base and like if if they just happen to grow up now would they still like like i don't know i don't know it's i think that that kind of a mindset the mindset you need to be a good scientist in my opinion is almost inherent Mm-hmm. I like I you can be taught and trained but I think that kind of like curiosity and putting connections together like that seems to be something I've noticed being inherent in a lot of people I guess what I'm saying is I think if William Buckland were alive right now in like a Yale PhD program or something I think he'd be like one of the students who were doing really well who everybody looked up to jokes on you oh god it's, hide it's, your it's, hearts <laughs> Dalton, I'm coming for you. Uh, um, but anyway... He'll steal your heart. Now we get to the part of the video where I have to very briefly um, paraphrase a poem by Percy Shelley. Um, uh, and I quote... Everybody's uh, favorite part of the video. I, 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 hey, everybody. Uh, 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 editor, put up the graphics package that we've made for this part of the video that James does in everything. What? We're... Before you paraphrase a poem... I, I have to interject because I don't want to contribute to forgetting the importance of women in history, which is that um, William Buckland's wife was also instrumental in the description of all the fossils that he worked on. Yep. Um, she did a lot of the illustrations mm. and uh, contributed enormously to our understanding of those fossils. That was actually... Uh, right, she was married? That's Protestant Reformation for you, if, bro. If memory serves, I think she was the one who did that, the illustration of Iguanodon that everyone likes to point out of the first one that has the thumb spike on the nose. That was a, that was a trivia question that we had, um, down at, a down at the, uh, conference in Brazil where we, it was five pictures of paleo art and you had to name the artist and one of them was that illustration of Iguanodon and... From Mary a lot of people got it wrong. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, what? that's uh, so. Dalton, I no, we got it entirely wrong. We we got an entirely different person. We we're like, ah, oh, damn it. Dalton, I appreciate you bring that up because I actually didn't know that um, before now, and I think it's an important thing to continue to emphasize. Um, with that, I now quote Percy Shelley, um, or I paraphrase Percy Shelley, um, and I uh, and I misquote. My name is Megalosaurus, King of Kings. Look upon my nomina dubia, ye mighty and despair. Um, thank you. Ooh. Because <laughs> my it's one of my favorite poems. My God. Oh, I thought I thought you had like an I thought I thought there was like an actual poem that was had been no. written about the <laughs> no no like I got I'm excited. sorry. There are some poems about like Megalosaurus and Iguanodon. Yeah. yeah, but that's not one of the ones I got. That that's <laughs> so disappointing. I'm so hold on. I I can't move past what you've just done to me. <laughs> Although honestly, you know, I'm I can move past it. But you should have done the beginning of that. I time. was gonna do the whole thing, and I was like, the video's over an hour long right now. I'm just gonna. Well, no, but like, because meeting a traveler from an antique land, and then either like, no, I went to a desert. Ooh, that'd be a good way to start a Gobi desert. Yeah, See, those, okay, it, it, to, yeah. tipping tipping my hand a little bit. I, I I've gotten the question before of just like if you could name a dinosaur, like what would you do? Um, and I want to name like I never will because I'm a fossil preparer and I don't get to name things. But um, like some sort of like titanosaur or giant theropod n- named something like Ozymandias because like the 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 idea in my head of two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in a desert, a shattered visage, and look upon the way it works, ye mighty in despair, nothing beside remains, is just such a f- amazing mindset. Uh, huh? Just paraphrase. Uh, I know, it, I agree. I, I agree. Although, isn't Ozymandias just Greek for, um... It's Ramses. Ramses. Yeah. With no further ado... I will, in a complete monotone voice, read out the entire list of nomina dubia associated with Megalosaurus. Oh, no. um, this is not us aping the format of Red Letter Media at all when they just list a lot of things that they think are stupid. Uh, but let's... Everyone stare, de- stare kind of off camera and have your mouth. 
down slightly if you are. Let, let's attempt to put Stanish Flea behind this again and get it demonetized. <laughs> Megalosaurus Horridus. Megalosaurus Cloacanus. Cloacanus. Yes. That's a good one. Megalosaurus Insignus. Megalosaurus Ooh. Mariani. Megalosaurus Schnei... Schneithymi? Megal... That's, That's my favorite, favorite, too. Megalosaurus Obtusus. Megalosaurus Pannoniensis. Megalosaurus Gracilis. Megalosaurus Nasicornis. Megalosaurus Aquilunguis. Megalosaurus Valens. Megalosaurus Trihenodon. Megalosaurus Hungaricus. Megalosaurus Lonziensis. Megalosaurus Cuvieai. Megalosaurus Woodwardi. Cuvieai is particularly rough to yeah, say. Yeah, it doesn't sound good. Megalosaurus Ingens. Megalosaurus Poikia Pluron. Megalosaurus Lydicari. Megalosaurus Turkami. Megalosaurus Woodwardi again. Megalosaurus Mersensis. Megalosaurus Nicaensis. Megalosaurus Africanus. Megalosaurus Pompili. Megalosaurus Silesiacus. Silesiacus, I guess? Yeah. Megalosaurus Inexpectatus. Megalosaurus Destructor. Oh, that one's cool. Megalosaurus Destructor? Like <laughs> Destructor. <laughs> Yeah, Megalosaurus Incognitus. Megalosaurus Andrewsi. Megalosaurus Chubutensis. Megalosaurus Rawzi. Megalosaurus Tanneri. Megalosaurus Schmidi. Megalosaurus Ornatus. Megalosaurus Monasterii. Megalosaurus Cambrensis. Megalosaurus Dunkeri. Megalosaurus Tibetensis. Megalosaurus da Pucaiensis. Megalosaurus Superbus. Megalosaurus Breedi. Megalosaurus Oeni. Megalosaurus Crenatissimus. Megalosaurus Bradleyi. Megalosaurus Parkeri. Megalosaurus Nethercombensis. Megalosaurus Saharicus. Megalosaurus Weatherillii. Megalosaurus Hesperus. That's all of them, I think. Oh my god. Um, now, eagle-eared viewers, you might recognize some of the species names, and there's a yes. reason for that. Like, Megalosaurus Nasicornis. I wonder <laughs> what that is. No relation. Who could guess? Right, yes. Um, so this is this is the problem that we had. So a lot of these names are just nomina dubia. Um, so nomen dubium is just... Uh, it's what we call an uncertain name, it's when the remains cannot be reliably attributed to that individual species or taxonomic rank within a group. So say you have like a, frag a fragment of a femur, you would, and you make that the holotype of Tyrannosaurus ozymandias. Um, then somebody says, that's just a fragment of a femur, and not only can we not know that it's that species of Tyrannosaurus, we can't know that it's a species of Tyrannosaurus, or even a theropod, or even a dinosaur. That would make your name a Nomen Dubia. Um, there are a lot of invalid names that can be, or types of invalid names. Um, the other one that we talk about a lot is uh, a Nomen Nudum, where the name is given, but there's actually no publication. That's a naked, a naked name. name. Um, a lot of these Appropriate are... Appropriate for scrotum right. from <laughs> a lot of these are nomina dubia so they're they're names that just don't really have a backing to them um a lot of the names though were now transferred to other theropods because it used to be very common to just find a fossil of a theropod and say it's a new species of megalosaurus i don't know why people used to do this and I open the floor if anybody's aware of the historical precedent for doing so, or if it was just kind of laziness. Yes, Alex. I I have two explanations. One is silly, and okay. one is slightly less silly. The slightly less silly version. This is something I kind of said before, but like, 
for those that were kind of named when the idea of what a dinosaur was was kind of hazy, like this is a thing you can just like. It looks like this, but it's different. So, you know, it's it's this thing we know and this different, right. but it's different. My second offer is, um, everyone really ran with the original idea that this was a large uh, Komodo dragon, and much like Moranis, they're like, how many species <laughs> names can we stuff into this genus? <laughs> yeah. I'll kind of I'll, I'll kind of piggyback off of Alex's first one and say that I, I I wouldn't be surprised if at least like this is only an explanation for some of the first ones, um, and some of the older ones that like it might be that they kind of didn't didn't know how much they had that like the extent of dinosaur diversity wasn't known. So like I bet that some people could kind of look at that and just go, oh, it's probably another species of that thing. Maybe there were just a couple of. Them. Right, yeah. and I mean I've heard about it. It. Um, well, I, I remember right. a little bit when I was reading Darwin's writings. Like they would talk about giant slots and call them megatheriums. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there, there was definitely a tendency to not. I think while they were giving them binomens they were either assuming we had much more of the fossil record or that the fossil or that extinct animals were much lower in diversity than modern things. Right. Cause I could, I could, I could charitably attribute it to either of two approaches. One is that we're sampling most of what used to be alive. So if we find like megalosaurus, there may have been many species of it, but you know, we know there was only ever going to be one of these giant lizards that was living in the past, which especially makes sense given Dalton's earlier statements about, prior conceptions of what deep time may have been. If you don't think it's literally millions of years or understand how small the modern day is in comparison to the age of the Earth, maybe you think that, yeah, there's only one kind of giant lizard and just some varieties of it. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. I can't back this up, and this would be something interesting to look into, maybe for our own content, but I'm thinking now, like, post-Darwin, like, post the ideas, like, hey, Earth is, like, old, and this is a constant process. Like once, once Marsh and Cope start, they're like, uh, make new name for literally everything we right. find. And I'm curious if that was like a, a shift in philosophy about like the past and how it's interpreted, or maybe it's like, hey, this is the new world. These can't all be. Well, a lot of them were. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, like. Like Megalosaurus Nazicorus. Right, like and um, Megalosaurus Aquilungus, which is then became Lelaps Aquilungus and now is Dryptosaurus. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the issue um, is a lot of like, yeah. this naming things Megalosaurus persists up into the like 90s. Yeah. That's that's the thing. The, uh -huh. Yeah, like, I, like, like yeah, Megalosaurus yeah, yeah. Tanneri is 1988. Uh, Megalosaurus Weathereye is Dilophosaurus, yeah. right? It's that's Dilophosaurus. Yeah, it's Torvosaurus. Yes. To, well, no, Torvus Tanneri is Torvosaurus. It's Torvosaurus. That one I kind well, yeah, of yeah, because at looks, least it's a megalosaur. At least it's a megalosaur. But like Dilophosaurus oh. was originally uh, megalosaurus. Yes, it was. Um, you will be. Like, you will. I'm sorry. You'll be happy I, to know that new th that uh, Megalosaurus Destructor became Nuthides Destructor. Oh, I'm glad Destructor Amazing. is still. Yeah. Nuthides. The tooth taxa. Tooth taxa? Damn it. Oh no. Oh what a cool name. Um I, I, I will say that on James's point earlier of that people would just casually refer to different ground sloths as just uh megatheriums. I wonder if again, this kind of only is an explanation for the first couple. Um if it was almost like a, a mindset thing of just like whenever you see kids at museums pointing at everything that's a uh, that's a theropod and just going like, oh, it's a tyrannosaur. Look, that that's another T Rex. That's a T Rex that has head crests. That's a T Rex mm. that has a <laughs> nose horn. Like, and it's just like, like, no, no, but also like, right for all intents and purposes, you know. right. Yeah, like wow. it's almost taking it's almost taking the the form of like theropod before we kind of like had that. Um, anyway, there there has been a long pause here because we all had to fight some respective battles. Um, but I'll summarize the entire segment on Megalosaurus taxonomy by saying that Megalosaurus is a genus, or Megalosaurus, as I said it in my elongated rant that Dalton might cut. Um, Oh, that'll be okay. That's good. Thank God. Or we might get sued for copyright infringement from Red Letter Media, but we'll see what happens. Um, Megalosaurus is what's known as a wastebasket taxon. 
which is essentially a taxonomic group, whether it be a genus or a family or um, or anything higher, that remains are kind of thrown into almost by default and often by convention, where you don't know what something is, and so you just say it's one of these. Um, generally, the field has stopped doing this. I think there was a time when it was felt that you had to identify anything you found, and so it led to a lot of these waste baskets that were often defined to some degree by looking primitive enough or generalized enough that anything could kind of be conceivably part of it. Um, so they're often not very derived members of clades. They're often at the base. Well, or various, or if they're known for very poor material, right? Because there's the huge, right? Like there's the megalosaurus of thoropods is titanosaurus. Right. Yeah. Um, and I mean, there's there's others as well. I'm trying to. Th I mean, there was Trachodon for a long time as a hadrosaur. Yeah. Um. Mm. Some of the things that were originally megalosaurus species actually then became their own wastebaskets. So in North America, theropod dinosaur teeth were essentially always either dinodon or laylaps. Uh, I think I know laylaps started at life as a megalosaurus species. I think dinodon may have as well. Um, and those became wastebasket taxa. I think Troodon was also used as one for a long time for, for teeth, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So these are very problematic, and when you're kind of in the know in a field, you generally understand that you're not really supposed to treat these wastebaskets as a anything resembling a real biological species mm -hmm. um, until they become the job of a PhD student uh, to clean up and reevaluate so that you understand what's going on with them. <laughs> um, more to come on taxes that have a lot of specimens and right. not as much work. Um, but in the, in the mid-2000s or late 2000s, I guess I should say around 2010, um, the PhD student in charge of cleaning up Megalosaurus and reevaluating a lot of it was Roger Benson, who was then a PhD student at the University of Cambridge and is now, um, as of quite recently, the curator of vertebrate paleontology at the American Museum of Natural History. Our special, uh, you know, the Macaulay curator of dinosaur paleobiology is, I think, his official title. Um, now, he started there after I finished my PhD there. So, so he and I didn't overlap. He wasn't my advisor, just in case that's confusing for anybody. My advisor was Mark Norell. Um, but I know Amelia works with him quite a bit. Um, she's not really here to... Uh, here to comment, but I know they, they talk a lot about her work and everything, although she also started well before he started. Um, and thank God he did his PhD. And sort of yes, thank God. Movie. And what he actually found is quite surprising to me. I didn't, I don't know if I really realized it before we dug into the literature more, um, but he pretty thoroughly evaluated all of the material that comes from the original mine that Megalosaurus came from. And he found that Essentially, all of the theropod material does, in fact, appear to represent one species. All of the repeated mm -hmm. elements have autapomorphies that are clearly distinguishing this one taxon. What is that? An autapomorphy? An autapomorphy yeah. is, simply put, a unique trait. More decisively, as usually phrased, although it doesn't seem like everybody always holds this to be a requirement, an autapomorphy is a unique derived trait. Um... It just means this is something that is only found in one species within this group. Um, the within this group thing, I think, means that it's hard to ever say anything's truly autapomorphic. Like, a true autapomorphy would be a trait that only occurs once in evolutionary history, and it is only found in yeah, that species. Right. Um, yeah, it, like, like synapomorphies, autapomorphies are derived from tree topology. So the order of branching uh, and how characters are distributed right. across. Um, but without a phylogenetic context, you can usually diagnose them, and this is still commonly what's done for taxonomy, although I think there's an argument and increasing push to do taxonomy through a systematic lens as well. That if you look at a bunch of bones and you say only these from this mine have these traits, I would call that an autapomorphy, even if you don't have a tree topology that necessarily backs it up. Um, Anyway, the important detail here is that all of the things that were repeated in multiple individuals in the mine showed the same constellation of traits, including the same unique traits. And so Roger Benson concluded there's actually only evidence for one theropod species in the mine. There are a couple of very small theropod remains that might 
be different species or might be juveniles of Megalosaurus. Um, I don't think he assigned all of those. But what this means is that Megalosaurus, despite being known like to be a taxonomic nightmare, the material available for the species is actually quite good. Um, we have a lot of it represented. We, we don't have a tremendous amount, but we have a bit, quite a bit relative to the rest of the British fossil record, which is quite scrappy. Like, so the neotype, right, is a, is a leg and a hip. And well, no, there's no neotype. There's a lectotype. I'm sorry, and that, that the lectotype the is, is the lectotype, right? Wait, so the is there not a no? There's, there's, there's a sin, so there's a sin type, which is what because when they described it, oh, they, okay. I, I don't. I think when they described it, kind of the idea of a holotype. I don't know if it didn't exist yet, or if they just weren't doing it for fossils. I don't recall the the history of that, but they didn't designate a holotype, but they designated all of these remains, which included the hip, and the sacrum, and the leg, and the dentary, mm -hmm. and I think some ribs and some other stuff is like this is the sin type all these specimens are megalosaurus and then when they're like oh we need one then the, the dentry was selected as the uh the lecto type which is picking one out of a sin type to be the the type specimen yeah okay cool. um so it's actually kind of funny in many cases where spesca taxa get dismantled entirely where you just say like this was a, a nomen dubium to begin with. There's no way to confidently refer material to the species. We're just going to either dispense with the name or give it a neotype, which is when you say, usually this is the specimen that has been the reference for this species for a long time, so this will become the name bearer of the species. Um, well, neotypes can usually be identified because they know Kung Fu. And they can go into bullet time. For those keeping track, that's our second Matrix joke when we mention the word neotype. Is it really? Yes. Did we already <laughs> Because you oh. groaned when I did it. Oh, so, right. so yes, uh, it, it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing. An example of an animal with a neotype, uh, not to mention it, the, its cursed name again in this video, but Spinosaurus. Like the specimen that a lot of the oh. science is being based on is the neotype because the original specimen was atomized by allied bombers in Ooh. World War II. Can we add the uh, young Frankenstein? Uh, what is it like? The horse? <laughs> like, the Frau Wucher? <laughs> yeah, Frau yeah. Wucher. Every time we say, every time we say. I, I, I think we have to do that. Yeah. No. Anyway, I mean that's the kind of taxonomic um, overview of the stuff. The Megalosaurus is known from quite a bit of material. One area where we don't really have a lot is the skull. Um, most of it is postcranial. This is not surprising. Skull bones are not common. Um, but these bones are sufficient to tell us what kind of theropod it is. Yes, Alex, this is your time. It, is it? It's my... phylogeny time. It's phylogeny time? Well, in addition to phylogeny, I'm also going to tell you when this animal was alive. Oh, oops. Oh my yet. god, we haven't. Um, oopsie whoopsie. In the past. Um, well, we know it's in England, but at least we talked about England. Uh, this is a middle Jurassic theropod, which is exciting. Not many of those. Because the middle Jurassic which is between the early and late Jurassic. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> um, which is, I think... That's um, why he's getting a PhD, everybody. 178? Like 163 million years ago? 166. Oh, oh, Megalosaurus specific. No. Uh, I thought you meant... No, okay. no, no, no. The Sorry. Jurassic is... Yeah. Anyway, 174 to 161. Unimportant. 174 to 161. All right, so that, low, that Oxfordian bound has changed, but that doesn't matter. Um, anyway, it's a very important period in dinosaur evolution, and it's probably the worst preserved, but our fossil record is telling us that a lot of important things are happening, um, and we have some fossils from it, uh, and the first dinosaur fossil is from it. So, uh, Megalosaurus is a... Now I'm saying Megalosaurus, and I usually say Megalosaurus. The mind virus is spreading. It sound smart? Yes, I am. Anyway, so this is obviously a theropod, and within the great, the great tree of theropod diversity, which is mostly birds, <laughs> but there's some stuff down here too. Um, there are tetanurin. So there are Pleistocene the ceratosaurs. Those are outside. Get out of here, we say. I mean, we've talked about tetanurins before in our monolithosaurus video, uh, but one of these very early diverging clades 
of Titnurans are Megalosaur. Or possibly Alasaur. But we can talk about that in a sec. So um, Megalosaur Rhea, as kind of traditionally conceived, uh, consists of Megalosauroids and Spinosauroids. We're not going to talk about Spinosauroids right now, but viewer, be aware that Megalosauroids might be very closely related to Spinosauroids. Maybe. Uh, within Megalosauroids, there are a few different subgroups, um, and I believe the... Ex oh, pardon me. I believe the group is exclusively known from the Jurassic. Uh, I think there were some taxa that were considered to be early Cretaceous, but those dates have changed. There are a lot of smaller clades within Megalosaur... I'm sorry, that the, the shadow of the Megalosaur looked like a, a pterosaur, and I was like, whoa. <laughs> Yeah, anyway, uh, all um, the so all the megalosaurids are Jurassic. Hmm. Okay, so yeah, they're megalosaurids, things like megal megalosaurus. I'm gonna say megalosaurus. Um, Torvosaurus, which we might talk about in a future date uh, when we do a, a different dinosaur game. T. <laughs> um, but then there are kind of other groups. The the Eustreptospondylines and Eustreptospondylus is kind of a walking with dinosaur fame. It gets heated real good in the Cruel Seas episode. That's a Megalosaur. Um, there are Afrovenatorines, or Afrovenatorids. I, I think it's a subfamily. Um, and then there are, are... Oh, I don't even want to attempt to say this one. It's the Pocheopleuron. Pocheopleuron, yeah. I think. Pocheopleurines, and those are uh, South American largely. So most Megalosaurs are... At least Megalosaurids are North American or Europe, mostly Europe. But Afrovenatorines are some of, of which are African, and then we have the South American clade. <coughs> I don't like saying dinosaurs are generic, but give me a moment. Uh, generic just means you don't understand it yet. But the body plan of Megalos of God. Uh, it is a mind virus. The megalosaurus is pretty standard uh, tetanurin theropod. So, three fingered hand, shorter forearms, long hind limbs, and then kind of long, pointy snout. Um, now, earlier when we were talking about phylogeny, I said maybe they're closely related to spinosaurs because recent, more recent phylogenetic results have placed them within Carnosauria. So, we talked about Carnosauria in an earlier video, but this is the group where you have allosaurs um, and your uh, Hercarodon their close relatives. So the phylogenetic analysis of, I think it's asphalt uh, Asphaltovenator. Asphaltovenator? As asphaltovenator. You um, just said asphaltovenator. I didn't say that. But, uh, Check the tape. Is, uh, uh, is, is a Carnosaurian theropod that appears to have features of both Megalosaurs and uh, more allosauri animals. So it's been proposed that this is actually a group within that larger Carnosaur group, and Spinosaurs in that case are right outside of that, which is, God, that's weird, <laughs> because it's an exclusively Cretaceous group that is showing up at the base of Tetanurans, uh, which kind of almost tracks to the Dalton phenomenon, is what I'm going to call it, of, sem of possibly semi-aquatic, late-surviving representatives of major clades being all that's known, sea platypus, crocodiles, housecaraptorines, etc. But yeah, um... It makes a little more sense if they're megalosaur, uh, if they're within megalosauria, because megalosaurs are showing up quite early. You know, maybe, you know, the ghost lineage isn't as completely fucked, it's still pretty bad. Anyway, uh, it is a current topic of much debate, is what we'll yes. say. They're definitely tetanurans, but there's some confusion. And I guess, as long as we're here, because we're not going to get another chance to talk about it, because this is the only megalosaur id in the game. This group may possibly represent the earliest evidence of feathers we have in theropod. Not Megalosaurus, but Ceramimus, um, which is this little, I think less than a meter long, <coughs> little uh, tetanurin theropod from Solnhofen. Germany. This was, it's Solnhofen? Oh, I thought you were saying that it was a Megalosaur. It's a, it might be a Megalosaur. It, oh. it might be. Oh. Um, yeah, so it Upon it, the original description, I think, has it as a as a young, a juvenile yeah. megalosaur. Um, and this has been contested. I think it's moved up the tree in some analyses. But 
that is a it's an interpretation. It's a result of a tree, and if so, that would mean that we have uh, filamentous feathers and mm -hmm. theropods at least by pet murans. And in my personal opinion, we, that's probably just something they're inheriting from their ancestors because it's likely that the ancestor of all dinosaurs. But that's just a cool little thing that you can. Yeah, take I was home. in Austria when that specimen when that was published because I remember trying to get internet access because I saw it on my like non smartphone at the time because it was 2011. I was in high school. I'm like, whoa, a feathered megalosaur? I want to see this. And it was very hard to do. And it's called Ceramimus uh, because it's got a big bushy tail like a squirrel. It's a yeah, very cool. Yeah, beautiful, model. beautiful specimen. That was Mark worked on um, with Ollie, right? That was Oliver. Rose, Rahu, yeah. Mark Norell. I don't know Rahu. if Rahu. Mark was on the original paper. He was, yeah. Okay. Yes. But anyway, I think we should rate this animal because we've been recording about it for two hours. Absolutely. Yeah. It's an important one. If we were going to run over, it makes sense we ran over on the first Yes. Time. Yes, of course. Well, we also had two long bathroom yeah. breaks, so. Yeah. Also, I, anything about the environment? It's, There's nothing. It's, a co it's coastal. There's dinosaurs and fish and plants. It um, I don't think there are other dinosaurs. There might be another. Ah, there's another there's theropod there. species that hasn't been named. I think. There's a couple uh, other. And dinosaurs. there's a heliosaur. Uh, there's a marine crocodile. Yeah. An indeterminate. Right, family. but these. And that's right. It. They're that's found it. It on coast. the coastline. We don't know if that it means was anything. There were ferns, cycads, and ginkgos, as well as conifers. So Ooh. I put all of those trees in here. I hope you enjoyed our beautiful German coastline because the UK map you can't go down to the deep. So I didn't use that. That to the species view where we go while someone had a question um, no I, I don't I think this is an interesting animal because I think it underscores the point that sometimes dinosaurs are more interesting for what they tell us about the history of the field and that how discovery works and how science progresses more than that there's anything inherently interesting about them as they're currently understood like yeah, it's unfortunate for, me for Megalosaurus that Jordan's Right, right. but I mean, if a relatively complete Megalosaurus is ever discovered, I think that'll rightfully be kind of considered a very, very major discovery to finally have a oh good God, biological that's... understanding yeah. of yeah. the first dinosaur. Yes, not the first one that evolved. The, right. first, one named, the yeah. first one that was ever named. The first known to science, as I often say. Who goes first? James. Oh, well, we we have Hello. channel... Hold on. I'm sensing... I'm sensing a, oh. a presence among us. I'm hearing... Amogus? I I've received a telepathic communication that indicates that Amelia ranks this a B tier. Did... did... Is Amelia in the room with us no, right she, now? Did Amelia she give says, any other information? She, she went back Wait, home. No, I'm picking up a... I don't hate it, but I love it. Oh, wow. I fucked that up so bad. I don't hate it, but I don't love it. <laughs> Is what she says. Fair. I, I'm gonna... I'm gonna go for the very... Unpo I'm gonna go with B tier as well. I like that it at least has some creative liberty taken with the design, with the kind of ornamental eye stuff and the ridge of osteoderms down the back, even though it's doing the lizard osteoderm thing. A lot of dinosaurs in this game do. Um, I think for something that we understand so poorly, I think they did a good job with making it have some flair and unique um, atmosphere of its own, rather than just doing what I think a lot of paleo art does sometimes and just taking a poorly understood animal and just either making it another animal or making it feel very generic. And while I don't love the design itself, I do like that they clearly at least gave it a lot of artistic thought to make this feel like a unique animal in its own right, which the species was. Um, that said, I don't think the design looks very good, so I'm going to give it a B tier. You're giving it a B and you're saying it, it isn't very good? Well, I it would be a C tier if I didn't think they at least tried. I don't like the final product, but I don't I appreciate that there was some effort that went into making it look like something. Soft. <laughs> Your ancestors think you're soft. <laughs> I looking soft. all right, hold on, hold on. No, now I need to defend myself. 
if you change your answer now, it's even softer. No, looking at what we have in C, I think what we have in C is worse than this. Okay. I stand, stand by, by your man. I respect it. So, I'm going to passionately and vehemently disagree with, with Dr. Jimbo here. Um, I, I, I will agree to an earlier point that, like, if if we were to find a full, like, complete skeleton of Megalosaurus, that it would be incredibly important. It would be, like, plastered all over the place. It would be really, really cool to actually see what this animal looks like. Uh, what I can guarantee is it wouldn't look like this. <laughs> I hate this model so much. It is one of my least favorite theropods. Uh, like, I like what it represents, and I think Megalosaurus is cool. I I can't... Okay, okay, starting at the front. I can't get over its jaws. It has a bit of an underbite. Like, its jaw doesn't articulate properly. Like, the top part of its bottom jaw, like, almost clips into the skull. I hate it. I, it's Its skull's way too wide. Its head's too small. Like, this isn't what a Megalosaur would look like. Like, I'm fine with the the artistic liberties. Like, I like the little spikes going down the back. I really like a lot of the colors. Dear God, like, why is, why is it so, why is its tail so droopy? Why does it look like it's constantly falling over? I, I It's walking animations make it look like it's stumbling home drunk from the bar. I'm putting this thing in D tier. I hate it. It's, it even sits wrong. This thing. All right, very you, strong you said emotions D? from Scott. I said D. Okay, I just wanted to, I, I wanted I to make really sure. Dislike, I really like, like it as actually, so to the point where like most of the time when it's walking around, if you just have it in its idle walk animation, it can't close its mouth properly. Like, it. this this thing gives me similar energy to like a pug walking around. Like, like you just look at it, you're just like, oh, that is hideous. I hate that I have to look at it. You hear it, it snuffling? Yeah, I bet this thing walked around just like, all the time. Like it's it's heinous, Pain, uh, Like I I like some of the aspects about it. I like some of the sounds it makes. Uh, I think it's a little snappy. Um, social animation's fun. Uh, I'm sad we didn't get to see it hunt a goat because I think its goat hunting animation is a blast. Where it just like slaps the thing on the ground a couple times. Um, that's fun. It's it, it's it's fun. I mm, D D. I, I hate it about as much as I hate Kamarasaurus. Wow. I guess that's mm -hmm. up to me now to give it a ranking. Um, I think Scott has some valid criticism, um, but he makes them in an emotional way. Uh, Fair. And as a stuffy New Englander, that makes me respect him less. I'm from the so. Midwest. My heart's on my sleeve. Um, yeah, so there are stupid things about this design. Uh, just one thing that I don't, that, that kind of is, drives me nuts about it, is that the body itself is kind of fleshed out. It's not like a, and I, quote unquote, this is literally giving me physical and psychic damage, shrink wrap. You know, it's got some meat on its bones, uh, but the head is like weird, and you can see all the f bones, whatever, doesn't really matter. Uh, if I start at the front, I'm going to say that I like the underbite. Because it reminds me, it looks like a sketch. It looks like they took the dentary of the thing in, in lateral view, and are just like, eh. and then we're gonna take like the upper skull of Debrillosaurus, and they traced it, and like th there's there's like a wave variation in its teeth that is, but probably based on something. I don't think that's what the animal's mouth looked like, but I find it rather charming. I like that they gave it kind of the uh, liz lizard uh, spike eyelashes or uh, eyebrow kind of dealio. I know it's a crest over its head, but I think they look like eyebrows. Um, its head is a little boxy. It's, I feel like the hands are a little small. It's got Trump hands. Just, you know, wow. Very funny. Yeah. Timely. Uh, color patterns are great. I like the scaling on the top. And I kind of love its stupid tail. And I can't prove this, but in my head, I've always seen this as kind of like an homage to like the, it's the first dinosaur and kind of like the droopy tailed, like 
weird reconstructions of the time. This, this, I don't mean for this to sound too positive because beyond it being the general shape of a theropod, it's not the coolest thing. And I would give this a high C, which is what it's going to get. Okay. So that's it. That's, those are my feelings. The head is a little small, but maybe that's what, maybe Megalosaurs be like that. Except a lot of them aren't. A lot of yeah. them are kind of long heads. I, oops. My, my biggest gripe with this is the head. I wish that they had, I mean, we, we mentioned Torvosaurus previously. I wish that they had taken a bit more inspiration from Torvosaurus because I feel like it, that, you know, when we find more Megalosaurus eventually, if we ever do, when it shakes out, it probably won't look exactly, it, I, I know it won't look exactly like Torvosaurus. I think it'll probably look more like Torvosaurus than it'll look like this. And so I think that'd be a better base to use. I really, in, in profile, it's okay. But head on, it just seems so wide. Its head is so wide. It's got a really blocky head. Um, I think there are some steps taken. Like, it, I mean, I, we don't mention the lips thing often because it's tedious to talk about, and the theropods in this game are by and large lipless. But like, I think it looks really good here without it. I think it looks like there's a lot of what's going on here. To me, is a nice Jurassic Parkification of Megalosaurus, like '93 Jurassic mm -hmm. Parkification. Like, I could see this being in that, but I even then, I think they would have giving it a, a better head like this looks just kind of like frankly it looks a bit like the jurassic park t-rex head and then they just kind of like put it in an industrial press but like for a, a microsecond just like, uh, i don't so the like ornamentation over the eye i feel like is just cut and paste from uh is it chinsaurus yeah chinsaurus has it which i also don't love in chinsaurus like the little multiple fragments of it i think in both instances like the idea of a, of an ornament there looks good, but the execution isn't my favorite. And here it just feels derivative of, of a better design. I don't love these spikes. I think they make, I think I understand that why they gave them that, which was like, this gives it a better profile. Um, like in terms of character design, it's a good choice to put those there in terms of like a dinosaur design. I don't love it. Um, the colors. I really love the base colors. I think I'd like, Unfortunately, a lot of the base colors are pretty dark, and all almost all the patterns are pretty dark. So the pattern, and I like the patterning on it quite a bit. Unless you use this like white one, it doesn't really show up well, um, which is unfortunate because it's really nice. I'm tempted to give it an S tier because it makes the sound from Suburban Sasquatch, but that won't oh. <laughs> that won't uh, push it over the edge for me. What do we have in C tier currently? Huangasaurus Diplodocus. Jurassic World, Velo like the base Velociraptor, yeah. Struthiomimus, and Carcharodontosaurus. I like this better than Carcharodontosaurus, but I think I'm still going to say C tier for this. So if we get two Bs, two Cs, and a D, I think that means that the Cs have it, correct? Yeah, but it's a high yeah. C. High C. Yeah. Okay. Like the fruit juice. All right. Yeah, no, Scott's not wrong in many of his feelings. But there's I, I can't in good conscience put this on the same level as Camarasaurus. Yeah, same here. That's fair. All right. So in that case, guys, um, we can officially say that Megalosaurus is going to be ranked. I'm going to put it above. I'm going to put it in the middle of C tier. I I would put it above the Velociraptor. Okay. All right. So would I. There we go. Bruh. Megalosaurus is C tier, and now. We get to find Ooh. out what the next dinosaur is. All right, guys, are you ready to spin the wheel? Yes. All right. It's time. I am. To spin. It's time. The. That. that wheel. wheel. There we wheel. go. That's how we oh, like it. Oh, I did it. No. <laughs> All right, another sauropod. All, All right, right. Apatosaurus right. time. All right, guys, so that is it for our discussion of Megalosaurus. Uh, thank you all for watching this far in the video. Um, before you go, I want to remind you that it really helps us out if you like this video and leave a comment to tell us what you thought. And if you haven't already subscribed to the Skeleton Crew, I don't understand why you would not subscribe to us. But if you haven't yet, you should do that. What's right. What's you? wrong with you? Fix your problems. Make sure, right. make sure you the fr stop it. Right. Get some the, help. As Jordan Peterson says... The first step to a happy oh life.
subscribe, subscribe to, to the Skeleton Crew. Subscribe to a happy life. Please do subscribe to the Skeleton Crew. Bucko. Hey, no, I'm sorry. That's not that weepy enough. That's Kermit. That, that, right. Well, that's my Kermit does turn. I mean, that is just. <laughs> it's my Kermit, but with less joy. <laughs> <laughs> Can you start crying about the worst guitarist <laughs> anyone's ever heard playing an awful cover of a song? <laughs> Can you start singing the Rainbow Connection? All right. Anyway, anyway, Jordan Peterson doesn't talk about the Skeleton Crew because we don't talk about Jordan Peterson here. But what you should talk about is supporting us on Patreon if you're able to and you like the stuff we make. It really helps us take the time to, um, you know, to make these videos as best as they can be and really put in the effort that we want to yeah. put in for all of you. Um, as a patron, if you, yes, Alex. I'm, I was saying, if you leave, if you know, if you're leaving comments but you're not subscribed, it's easy. Get subscribed. Go on our Patreon. Every time you don't subscribe, but check out our video. James comes to my house and he puts out lit cigarettes on me and Dalton. <laughs> our back is covered with unsightly scar. Um, Please, you, you can, can. <laughs> and you should. Now, as a patron of our Patreon you will have access to a bunch of member um, benefits. These include access to our patron-only Discord server. You can access our voice channel. You can vote on patron polls. You can send us questions for monthly, roughly monthly patron Q&As. And if you support us at a very high tier, you can give us a one-time custom video request on any topic in paleontology of your choosing. Um, now, as Whoa. of right now, I assume that the editor of this video, who I believe is Dalton, uh, this round, will put up a scrolling list of our patrons to give them all credit at the end of the video. But some of our patrons support us at such a generous tier that we give them all a spoken shout out. And as of recording this video, those patrons are Benjamin Seepser, Philip Fico, Andrew Niddle, Florida Man, Max Ironpaw, Riley Shero, and Wheat. Thank you guys for your incredibly generous support. Thank you to all of our patrons and to all of our viewers for your continued support of this channel. This is the Skeleton Crew, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Adios.